I have just accepted Her Majesty the Queen. Her Majesty the Queen. Buckingham Palace. His Majesty the King's. Kind invitation to form a new government. A new government. A new government. To form a government. That I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. I will shortly leave the job. That the process of choosing that new leader should begin now. 44 days. That's how long it took for Liz Truss to come to power, crash the British economy, and then be forced to resign. The UK has now had three prime ministers in seven weeks, and its economic prospects are dwindling. The pound has collapsed, inflation is rising, and the country has slipped into recession, all while its politics grows more dysfunctional. What is behind Britain's economic malaise? Is it Brexit? Russia? Politics? Why is the UK falling behind its European counterparts? And can the new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, find a solution or is he part of the problem? All that in this video. But first, good news. I just got my first sponsor, ExpressVPN. Now, have you ever tried to look up an article or a video or a series and it wasn't available in your country? Well, this is where ExpressVPN comes in. With ExpressVPN, I can change my country of origin and get unrestricted access to any news and media from anywhere in the world, including Russia. And that helps me to do the research I do to make these videos. And with ExpressVPN, I can do all of that with a VPN that's faster, more secure, and more customer friendly than anything that's out there. So if you want to help out this channel, as well as getting three months extra of ExpressVPN for free, go to expressvpn.com slash my take. Link in the description. Now back to the video. 44 days. The immediate cause of Britain's economic crisis is quite simple. I have three priorities for our economy. Growth, growth, and growth. That is the mantra with which Liz Truss promised to deliver Britons from the UK's economic woes of high inflation and a declining economy. Her plan was simple. Massively slash taxes, especially for the rich and for businesses, to induce economic growth and cushion the impact of surging energy prices. What did that look like in practice? Abolishing the 45% top marginal tax rate for the rich. Scrapping the cap on bonuses paid to bankers. Reversing the planned increase in the corporate tax rate from 19% to 25%. Cutting the basic income tax rate from 20% to 19%, tightening controls on people receiving welfare benefits, and much, much more. In total, this package encompassed £45 billion in unfunded tax cuts, mostly for the rich, as well as a two-year freeze on energy bills that would cost £100 billion per year. For comparison, Britain's COVID furlough scheme cost just £70 billion. In total, her economic rescue package would be the largest tax cut in 50 years. How was she going to pay for this? She refused to implement spending cuts or levy taxes on the windfall profits of energy companies. There was only one way to pay for this tax giveaway. Massive government borrowing. In a time of immense economic uncertainty and rising interest rates, Essentially, her plan was a 21st century version of trickle-down economics. The results? Catastrophic. Almost as soon as the plan was announced, the pound collapsed by 30% as international investors lost confidence in the British economy. At the same time, the value of British government bonds also plummeted, which almost collapsed the pension funds. You see, normally governments can borrow money either by taking loans from international institutions like the IMF, which usually comes with strings attached, or by selling government bonds on credit markets. Essentially, investors lend the government money, which is then paid back with interest over time. And because government bonds are usually considered a safe investment, British pension funds invested massively in government bonds. But because Truss's tax cuts massively increased the amount of government borrowing in a short period of time, the value of these bonds collapsed, which threatened to collapse the British pension funds and plunge the elderly into poverty. 
In order to save the pension funds, the Bank of England had no choice but to begin buying up £65 billion worth of government bonds to drive the price back up, as well as raising interest rates to save the currency and fight inflation. But raising interest rates in turn made it more expensive for people to pay off the mortgages on their homes, which cut demand for real estate, threatening to collapse the housing market. So within days of announcing £45 billion in unfunded tax giveaways, Liz Truss had succeeded in collapsing the currency, almost rendering the pension funds insolvent and almost crashing the housing market. As Truss struggled to defend her economically illiterate policies, she had no choice but to fire her chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, and appoint Jeremy Hunt, who promptly reversed all her policies. But the real blow was political. Support for Liz Truss imploded as her approval ratings collapsed to just 10% and support for the Conservative Party dropped to 22%. With support for the opposition Labour Party surging to 53%, the Conservatives realised that as long as trust remained in power, they were headed for an electoral wipeout. She had no choice but to resign. But the causes of Britain's economic woes go much deeper than this and extend far further back than the 44 days of Truss's tenure. Even before Truss, the UK's economy was in a vulnerable position. At 10.1%, inflation is the highest in 40 years. Economic growth has flatlined at near 0%. Unemployment, now at 3.5%, is expected to surge to 6.4% as the country slips into recession. And there are several structural causes for this. The Brexit Effect in the 1990s and 2000s, Britain's economy thrived. Access to European markets stimulated economic growth. Low interest rates made investment cheap, and access to cheap energy from the North Sea and cheap labour from the EU kept inflation low. But now all those factors have gone into reverse, and one of the main reasons is Brexit. Let June the 23rd go down in our history as our Independence Day! Simply the announcement of the referendum result in 2016 caused the British pound to decline by 11% against the dollar within the space of four days. Just this devaluation alone led British consumer prices to increase by 2.9%, which amounts to an increase in the cost of living of £870 per year for the average British household. But the real damage started after the UK officially left the EU in January 2020. Massive lines of trucks stuck at the border, empty supermarket shelves, fuel shortages, labour shortages, the list goes on. Now you might say that this has to do with Covid, not Brexit, and that would be partially true. But the economic evidence says otherwise. Take a look at this graph of British exports versus exports from other advanced economies. In 2020, exports worldwide collapsed as a result of the pandemic. But as exports began to recover in other countries, British exports remained low. In fact, British exports fell by 14% compared to just 8.2% in other advanced economies. And the reason is simple. Brexit has made it more expensive to do business and more difficult for British businesses to export their goods because now they have to contend with two sets of regulation, one set from the EU and one set from the UK. And now that the UK plans to abolish over 3,800 pieces of EU legislation and regulation, covering anything from workers' rights to environmental protection and product labelling, the UK will become even less aligned with the EU in terms of regulations, which will make it even harder to export to EU nations. Britain's largest market. On top of that, British businesses have to deal with unnecessary red tape and trade restrictions and many businesses are dealing with labour shortages because they can no longer rely on EU workers. And unfortunately, this will mainly hurt small businesses as large businesses can afford the extra costs and red tape that comes with being outside the EU. But small businesses cannot. According to the UK's own Office for Budget Responsibility, in the long term, Brexit will cut UK GDP by 4% or £100 billion. 
pounds. In 2023, the UK will have the lowest economic growth of any G20 nation except Russia, the most sanctioned country in the world. This is the Brexit effect, and it's hurting the British economy and the British people. And ordinary British people are starting to notice. A majority, 52%, now believe that Brexit was a mistake, while just 35% still think it was the right decision. But it would be dishonest to blame this entire crisis on Brexit alone. Stagflation Geopolitical factors beyond Britain's control are worsening the crisis. First came Covid. The sudden collapse in worldwide demand that came with the pandemic broke the world's supply chains, which had been based on just-in-time production. As demand came back in 2021, supply chains couldn't keep up. Too much demand, not enough supply. The result? Inflation. Worldwide. On top of that, China, the workshop of the world, continues to enforce lockdowns which are reducing production and therefore further restricting supply. And then came Russia. Ukraine and Russia are collectively responsible for producing 29% of the world's grain, and Russia is the world's third largest oil producer and second largest gas producer. The war in Ukraine and the sanctions that followed knocked out massive amounts of food and energy from the world market, causing inflation to surge. In the last energy crisis, Britain could rely on its own North Sea oil and gas fields to bring down energy prices and therefore inflation. But this option is no longer on the table. British oil and gas output peaked in 2000 and has been declining ever since. And the result is a massive cost of living crisis. Households across the UK are about to experience an 80% jump in energy costs, double-digit inflation for the first time in 40 years, and the country's electricity operator has warned of the possibility of nationwide blackouts. And this is causing increasing social unrest. Trade unions across multiple sectors of the economy are going on strike, and the don't pay movement is calling on people to refuse to pay their energy bills in an act of civil disobedience. The UK of today looks like the UK of the 1970s era of stagflation. Brexit has killed growth for the British economy, leading to stagnation, while broken supply chains, Chinese lockdowns and the Ukraine war are causing inflation. Together, that makes stagflation. But is there any way out of this crisis? Rishi-nomics Britain's new Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has inherited an economy damned for the immediate future by crippling inflation driven by rising energy costs, rising borrowing costs driven by high interest rates, slowing economic growth driven by Brexit, political instability driven by dissatisfaction, and no strategy on how to revive growth. We now need stability and unity Stability. That is the mantra of Rishi Sunak. During the Conservative leadership campaign, he warned Liz Truss of the dangers of unfunded tax cuts. Yes. That's uh, simply not right. You promised me. almost excuse £40 me. billion pounds of unfunded tax cuts. But £40 billion pounds more borrowing. That is the, company, the country's credit card. It's our children and grandchildren. Everyone here is that kids. Is, that so we're going to have true. to pick up the tab for that. Rishi, that and is not true. nothing conservative about doing Und that. And since taking power, he has focused on bringing back stability and confidence to the British economy, while exercising fiscal prudence. This means that Rishi Sunak's policy will involve some combination of tax increases and spending cuts in order to bring down the government deficit and reassure markets. This means that the scheduled tax increases that Liz Trust tried to cancel, such as the increase in national insurance, the introduction of a health and social care levy, and increases in corporate and income tax will be reintroduced. On top of that, Sunak's Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has already called on government departments to start finding areas where they can implement spending cuts. In other words, the UK is likely headed for austerity. While these plans will succeed in balancing the government's budget and reassuring markets, 
They won't deal with the structural problems in the UK economy, nor will they deliver growth. You see, as the UK enters recession, the government's tax revenues will decrease, forcing it to raise more taxes and cut more spending. But this takes even more money out of the economy, further compounding the recession, which further reduces government revenues, forcing it to implement even more austerity. This is pretty much what austerity did after the 2008 crisis, delaying Britain's economic recovery and feeding the political discontent that led to Brexit. At the same time, the structural factors holding back the UK's growth are unlikely to change in the short term. Even as support for Brexit begins to wane, there is no way that any Conservative leader will try to bring the UK back into the EU or otherwise seek a closer relationship with the Union. As we speak, the British Parliament is attempting to repeal 3,800 EU laws, causing the UK to drift even further away from the EU. And Rishi Sunak himself campaigned for Brexit back in 2016. As for inflation, most of its causes are beyond the government's direct control. Only an end to the Ukraine war and an increase in energy production by OPEC can bring energy prices back down in the short term. And only an end to China's zero-COVID policy and the rebuilding of supply chains outside of China can reduce inflation, which will take years. But as we wait for the geopolitical situation to improve, Rishi Sunak will face increasing pressure to deal with inflation from all sides. Any attempts to cut back on public spending will be strongly opposed by the trade unions and the public at large, with many unions threatening nationwide strikes. And any attempts to raise taxes will be opposed by the right wing of the Conservative Party. You see, Rishi Sunak will not be able to implement any transformational policies because he has inherited a divided Conservative Party. Liz Truss was not alone. She was supported by a large group of right-wing Tories eager for Thatcherite-style tax cuts and trickle-down economics. Rishi Sunak, on the other hand, is from the relatively more moderate wing of the party, which favors fiscal responsibility and austerity. Some Tories want lower taxes, others want more austerity. Some want less immigration, others want more immigration. Some want to focus on rebuilding Britain's neglected northern regions, while others want to focus on traditional conservative areas in the south. Having to contend with all these factions will make it difficult for Sunak to deliver anything more substantial than keeping the ship from sinking. But achieving real growth and reducing the cost of living without increasing inflation requires more than just austerity or unfunded tax cuts. Instead, what Britain needs is a plan to raise taxes from those who can afford to pay, to subsidize energy bills for those who can't, and invest in wind and nuclear energy to bring down energy costs in the long term and achieve energy independence. Liz Truss promised a two-year freeze on energy bills that would be financed by energy subsidies costing £100 billion per year, but had no plan to pay for it. Rishi Sunak needs to implement some kind of energy subsidy in order to keep the cost of living affordable for ordinary people. The best way to finance this without causing economic chaos or further squeezing the British people is to expand the windfall profits tax on energy companies. It is these companies who are profiting from the energy crisis and it is they who can afford additional taxes. While a 25% windfall profits tax was already implemented in May, it contained many loopholes and deductions. The Labour Party has proposed expanding the windfall tax and closing the loopholes in order to raise more money for energy subsidies. But this has been rejected by the Conservatives. And other policies that would raise money to solve the energy crisis without unsustainable borrowing, like a wealth tax, have also been rejected by the right. The ultimate consequence of the conservative mismanagement of the British economy over the last 12 years will be political. Even though the appointment of Rishi Sunak has recovered some support for the Conservatives, with Tory support at 27%, up from 22, the Conservatives are still 22 points behind Labour. If an election were called today, it would be a total electoral wipeout. Now, a general election is still two years away, which gives Sunak time to facilitate an economic recovery. But this is unlikely to happen merely with austerity policy. The general economic trends are going negative and Sunak's weak government will be unable to deal with the structural causes, namely Brexit and the energy crisis. It's unlikely that the economy will have significantly recovered by 2024, 
even with Sunak's leadership. Instead, he could preside over the largest drop in living standards since the 2008 crisis. Is Britain becoming the sick man of Europe? Find out in this video. Don't forget to get ExpressVPN and get three months extra free using the link in the description. Consider becoming a Patreon to support the channel. Leave a comment for the algorithm. Thank you to my Patreons including Linda, Richard and many more for making this video possible. Like, share and subscribe. Because this was my take.